Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Good evening and welcome. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. And tonight we present The Conjuring. The Devil Made Me Do It. This movie's out in theaters. It is the third installment in the base Conjuring universe. Of course, you've got the Nun and and uh, Annabelle movies and and uh, every, uh, La Yalorna are, are all out there as part of this broadened universe. But the third and may, possibly final installment of the original trilogy is out. And if you have not had a chance to see it, it's a great movie. I really enjoyed this one. Uh, it's a step different than the other two have felt. And I like that. I like that they're kind of changing with every movie that they've released. Um, there's also a documentary. They call it a shock doc on discovery plus and travel channel. The devil made me do it. And it is an examination of this case joining us tonight. A good friend of our program. He is a paranormal investigator, author, writer, researcher. He is the host of our new link, new England legends podcast. We'll have a link for that on today's show as well. It is our good friend, Jeff Belanger. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Dave, good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so our heads are almost as large as they are in real person. Uh, hey, so this is this is an interesting case, right? And, you know, the time that it happened, shortly after the Exorcist movie had come out, right? Uh, yep. ju just at the beginning of the satanic panic that was going on in the 80s. And you've got this interesting case that involves... Um, demonic possession, uh, an exorcism that goes horribly awry and a murder that may potentially be attached to this. And it's easy to say, well, listen, those were the seventies and eighties, this type of thing. Obviously we've gotten brighter, you know, the, the concept that the devil made me do it just is not real anymore. I, I have two news stories from this week, Jeff, I wanted to share with you in the audience and get your, get your take on it. I specifically like this uh, first one. A Florida teen allegedly committed burglary to pay for college, which is honorable. Really? It, it is right. Sure. Uh, except for the fact that he said it was Satan that tempted him to do it. <laughs> a Florida teen was arrested Friday on felony armed burglary charges during his interrogation at the Indian river County Sheriff's office. He allegedly told law enforcement he was tempted to commit the robberies by Satan and that he had planned to use any money he acquired towards college. It's kind of one of those Robin Hood feels, right? You're stealing from right. the rich to to better your life so that you don't have to be in a life of crime. It's a strange, strange dichotomy. Uh, Rafael yeah. Woloski, an 18-year-old resident of Vero Beach, was picked up Friday evening just a few blocks from his family's home after allegedly using a broken window to enter the home of a neighbor who lived across the street, according to police documents. He was reportedly carrying a knife with a two-and-a-half-inch blade. The defendant said he decided to burglarize homes to get money for college. He also said the devil kept tempting him to steal. And the arrest, that's according to the arrest affidavit report. The report also reveals that the neighbor called 911 about a burglary in progress, saying someone broke a house window and was still in her home. She apparently described him to emergency services as a white male wearing a red hat and blue shirt. Wolowski was found nearby soon after wearing a camouflage cap and uh, with red writing on the sides and a blue shirt. When officers stopped him and read him his Miranda rights, Wolowski allegedly admitted to the crimes as well as two other robberies in the same neighborhood, and he was taken to the sheriff's office. The report made no mention of Wolowski uh, requesting a lawyer after he confirmed he had been read his Miranda rights. Instead, he appeared to willingly give police a step-by-step -step breakdown of this burglary. The affidavit says the defendant stated that he left his residence on Berkshire Circle and walked across the street to a neighbor's house, also 
on Berkshire Circle. He cut the screen with a knife, entered the patio, looked through the window leading into the main living room of the home and saw a woman inside. He described her as possibly Hispanic with dark hair and possibly wearing a black and white dress. He then ran from the home. The patrol deputies later made contact with the homeowner who fit the description of the woman the defendant described. So there's really no way of getting out of this at this point when you've described perfectly the defendant whose home you've broken into, and she's described you pretty well. Uh, there's no mention of details of the other two burglaries. Woloski remains in Indian River County Jail, having not made the $75,000 bail, and faces three charges of armed burglary dwelling, structure of conveyance. His arraignment is scheduled for August 13th. So that's, okay, a random story about the devil well, made do it. Hold on, Dave. Ironically, $75,000 pays for about one year of college. Maybe he just wanted to test the waters. Yeah. He wasn't looking know. for <laughs> Yeah. Now, no, but right. It, it's the devil made me do it is as old as, as the hills. But yeah, of course, it, it's still turning up today. The second story we've got, Teen allegedly drowned his father, claiming to try to baptize him to exercise a demon named Dirty Dan out of him. Yeah, a young man allegedly killed his father, then claimed he baptized the man to exercise demons, including one named Dirty Dan. Jack Callahan, 19, appeared in court Monday in the death of Scott Callahan, 57, in Plymouth County, Massachusetts. Right in your neck of the woods here, buddy, according to mm -hmm. local reports. Police described the matter as a fatal water incident in early social media posts saying they received... <laughs> fatal water? Okay, no, yeah. that's, that's the name of my band, by the way. <laughs> Fatal water incident. I'm sorry. Go on. Man and we're died. not laughing at the crime. We're laughing at yeah. the absurdity of the things written. Right. Uh, they call it a matter of fatal water incident. In early uh, social media posts saying they received a call Monday morning of a missing man. First responders found the victim submerged in a pond. He was later pronounced dead despite attempts to save his life. The medical examiner has yet to official uh, to offer an official determination for the cause and manner of death. But the Jack Callahan has pleaded not guilty to murder. Preliminary findings is that Scott suffered from waterlogged lungs, broken blood vessels in the eyes, and an abrasion on the head, according to a statement from the office of the Plymouth District Attorney. The story is that Jack Callahan went to a bar in Boston to get his father, who should not have been drinking, according to CBS affiliate WBZ. The men took an Uber to Island Creek Pond in the town of Duxbury, where they lived, and the father is alleged to have struck the son, and the altercation progressed to the pond, the younger Callahan allegedly said. Further allegations complicate things beyond a mere attempt to claim self-defense. Defendant Callahan allegedly said he thought he was baptizing his father to exercise demons, one of them named Dirty Dan. Prosecutor Shannon Buckingham told the court, uh, according to a report by independent television station WHDH, he described that he was holding his father in the pond on the back like a baby and that he continually dunked the father's head in the water for about four to eight times. Then uh, that's when the father started to cough and choke. He would lift his head up, and then when his father started to fight and strike, he would push the head back down under the water. Buckingham told the WBZ report he did so until his father was no longer struggling and began floating. I left him there to decide, you can come to heaven or with me to hell. I think he chose hell, defendant Callahan said, according to the prosecutor. Defense lawyer Kevin Reddington reportedly requested a mental health evalu evaluation and said his client might be a danger to himself. That seems like a bit of an understatement to me, Jeff. Yeah, I'd say so. The, the concept that the devil is involved in our bad activities, right? Nobody wants to, to believe that our neighbor, our friend, our lover could be a killer, that we could have been so close to this person all along and not realizing the power that that they might actually wield and, and what kind of anger and rage lies just underneath the surface. So it's, we almost want to put that off on something, especially supernatural, right? It must be an influence of the devil. We saw that, unfortunately, with, with the death and suicide of our friends, Mark and Debbie Constantino. Uh, boy, sure. can you believe that's six years already since wow. their passing? Yeah. And people immediately jumped to the fact that, that there must have been demonic influence, spiritual influence, something that caused this couple to break down the way they did and end in murder-suicide. Uh, knowing what we know from the outset, you and I have been very vocal about the fact that it's probably just two people that were in a very dysfunctional alcoholic relationship. And, um, 
And that's what really took place. But it shows the willingness of people to want to put that somewhere besides on just the human dynamic of who we are. The devil's always been a scapegoat, right? Always. Uh, Puritans used to have erotic dreams. And they would say, wait a minute, I, I'm of pure heart. I go to church. I pray every day. I read the Bible. Uh, obviously, this is an incubus or a succubus. This is a, 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 de a demon coming to me in my sleep and trying to tempt me. There's no way that came from within me. Uh, so therefore, it's, a, it's an external force. Um, I'm a good person, yet I just did a horrible thing. Therefore, it must not have been me. I, I think of myself as a good person. So some some horrible influence must have taken over, devil, demon, whatever. The reality is, as we know, there is evil in the world. I mean, just right. look at the news, right? People do unspeakable acts, horrible atrocities, uh, mass murder, uh, just every horrible thing you can do to a person, people do it. Uh, we also know, thankfully, that there's good in the world. We've seen it. Mm -hmm. We've seen uh, just acts of kindness from random small acts to just big things and everything in between. And I think all those forces are within all of us. And some of us, uh, you know, kind of yield to one more than the other. And, and uh, depending on your moral compass, your upbringing, the influences around you, um, you know, we, we tend to lean either way. That being said, I do recognize that some people do have their problems, right? Drug addiction, alcoholism, stuff like that. And if you want to call that a demon or a monkey on your back, I get it. I get it. But at the ultimate, ultimately, you have to still take responsibility for your actions at some point. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Obviously, we have logic on our side to, to be able to look at these cases in a somewhat rational way. But we've also worked in the paranormal field and know quite a few people that have dealt with dark presence, mm -hmm. uh, demonic infestations, you know, people that we know, like, and trust. So should we be so quick to dismiss the concept that something demonic could, in fact, affect someone to create violence or do something outside of their their nature or is are the is their nature again is this one of those moments where their nature is possibly prone to it and that's what the devil that's what the evil is looking for is that person that already has that fracture so that they can enter and move through them i love the jewish concept of uh spirit attachment uh the dibbic right mm -hmm. so uh, a dibbic uh, it, it means like cling or cleave to and a dibbic can be good uh, if, mm -hmm. if you're of the Jewish faith. Uh, a spirit could attach itself to you like you're trying to quit smoking. And a, a spirit that did that in life might attach itself to you and sort of help you through that. And then once you quit smoking, it leaves you peacefully and everything's fine. However, the, there can be sort of like bad influence dibbics. You want to do drugs. You want to rob a liquor store. Um, a, a spirit that might have done that in life might cling to you. And there is a Jewish exorcism. And, and it's quite beautiful actually the the rabbi will blow the shofar to it's like this ram horn to try to separate the the human and the the, the spirit attachment and then heal them both right heal the mm. spirit go, go forth you don't need to be here anymore you 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 have rights and you should be happy too and and the per person of course needs to be left alone and so i i like the idea that uh like is drawn to like so yes well i think dark forces can be let in you put yourself into a place to allow those dark forces in. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, whatever bad thing happens, still you got to put the blame on the person, not on the, the demonic force, right? Like, I, 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 you know, what, what's first, the cart or the horse, right? I, I, you know, uh, I get it. But I think all of us have a responsibility to be good neighbors, good citizens, and, and work to keep those forces away so we're not a danger to others. I mean, hopefully not ourselves either, but at the very mm -hmm. least, not a danger to others. Now, that's where this case that we're going to talk about tonight gets sticky because, again, you we've always been told you have to invite this in. You have to be kind of a willing participant, yet David Glatzel was not a willing participant. And why would he be affected? So we'll discuss that. Now, uh, for those of you that don't know, the uh, this case, again, one of the famous cases by Ed and Lorraine Warren featured in the new Conjuring movie. And I, I want to start a little bit with history from you, Jeff. Uh, Aside from them just being these legendary figures that many of us only know through the movies and books, uh, I know I was lucky enough to meet uh, Lorraine two or three occasions and have her on the show three or four times throughout the years, but you actually grew up knowing the Warrens and working with them, right? So talk to me a little yeah. bit about that. 
Yeah, and in fact, this case, this Conjuring 3 Devil Made Me Do It case is pretty special because, uh, to me anyway, it's personal. It started in Newtown, Connecticut, which is where I grew up. Uh, so Newtown, geographically, is on the western side of Connecticut, and it is the town just uh, to the north of Monroe, which is where Ed and Lorraine Warren live, and just south of Brookfield, which is where this exorcism and the, the, the case would really take off. So we're talking about three towns in a row and not very big towns. So growing up uh, in Newtown in the 80s, uh, the Warrens were like local celebrities. The first time I met them was October and they were giving a program at the library, you know, just like I do now, you know, like just uh, 20, 30 people, locals get invited to the library and the Warrens would share their, you know, share their, their, their case files and play audio clips and show a literal slideshow with like a slide projector and talk about some of the stuff they did. And I was just so intrigued because I had friends who claimed their houses were haunted in town. Uh, nothing scary, but just matter of fact. And and in, in Newtown, you know, I remember there was a place right on Main Street. There was this, uh, it was a home that was turned into a business. And people would say like, oh, you know, that house is really haunted, like scary haunted. And you'd be like, okay, whatever. And then someone would say, no, no, the Warrens checked it out. And like, mm -hmm. that was the end of it, right? That's the last word. Oh, oh, well, maybe it is then. Fair enough. Um, so that's where I first met them. And as I got older, you know, you'd go see them every fall. You'd go see their Halloween program where they'd share real ghost stories. And then when I started to become a writer in, in college, uh, I started interviewing them. So I'd go to their house and I'd get to like go through their museum and interview Ed and Lorraine and sit in their kitchen. And so, yeah, I, I first met them when I was 12 and just, you know, uh, Lorraine went to our church and you'd see them in the grocery stores. And like I said, very much local celebrities, right? Not big mobs, nothing. They are way more famous today than they ever were back then. Getting a chance to sit down with them in, in their natural environment. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot said about Ed and Lorraine Warren, a lot of uh, conjecture of, of were they fakes? Were they real? Uh, you had a chance to see and be around them. Did they take this as seriously at home? Was it a little bit more glib and light or were they always kind of in that serious tonality about what they were dealing with. So Lorraine, and you know, cause you've met her, Lorraine was like everybody's grandma. And she was like that in the eighties too, even before mm -hmm. she got as old. I mean, you know, she lived what? 90s? 92. 92, 92 when she yeah. passed away last year. Right? Yeah. So when she was like, you expect a woman in her eighties to be grandmotherly, but even, you know, 20 years before that, when she was in her sixties, she was just, she called everybody honey, you know, just like mm -hmm. honey, let me tell you, honey. And just, you know, very sweetheart, kind hearted uh, people, both of them. Ed was very funny. Um, he could be <laughs> funny and charming. Um, and then he could turn on a dime and get real serious when talking about demons. So at our little library programs, you know, he'd just be like working the audience like, oh, anybody see a ghost? Yeah. Ghostbusters. Sure. Right. You know, and just like funny right. and charming and then just stop and be like, let's talk about something real, though, something that really happened. And he could the room would just sort of be like, Ooh, you know, mm. uh, you'd kind of get choked up. Um, I sat in their kitchen once interviewing them. And their phone, this is, you know, uh, 1996, maybe. And the phone used to just ring all the time because their phone number was listed. There was really no Internet yet. I mean, there was Internet, but no one they didn't have it. You know, I mean, it right. was people weren't using it widely. And the phone rang all the time. And Lorraine would just pick it up and I would hear, you know, that side of the conversation over and over. And it was Dave. It was the same almost every time. Hello. Yes, honey. Yeah, this is Lorraine Warren. Oh, oh, honey, that sounds bad. Oh, honey, is there a Ouija board in the house? Oh, you got to get rid of that, honey. You got to get rid of that right away. Okay, yeah, all right, good luck to you. Okay, all right, bye-bye. And then it would ring again, and that same phone call, like, wow. is there a Ouija board? Yep, there's a Ouija board. And they and over and over and again, they would just, but they would take the call, and they would talk to people. It was amazing. I know in talking with Lorraine on our show and meeting her at a few live events, talking to her off stage, she would tell me that, you know, uh, they answered the phone day or night because you never knew when something horrific might happen. And I know she took it very seriously in concern for these people that, uh, that would call in. Um, here's a quick, quick little, uh, a bit of trivia, Jeff. Do you know that there was a movie about this case? in 1983 that was released. I didn't know that. 
And here's mm-hmm. one of the stars of the movie. This is a scene from the movie. Kevin Bacon. It's one of his first acting roles. And guess who played the... They, they didn't have the legal rights to, to Ed and Lorraine's story, but they were they were writing it off of everything that was being told in the news. Uh, yeah. So this is the movie, and it is on, on YouTube, The Demon Murder Case from 1983, starring Andy <laughs> Griffith as Ed Andy, Warren. Andy Griffith. And yeah. uh, Kevin Bacon, of course, lives in Connecticut now. Yeah. So, so not far from Brookfield. Pretty cool. And it is, like I said, it's on YouTube. You can go watch the full 1980s cheese ball effect. But I just, I had a laugh when I read that, uh, that, that Andy Griffith played the Ed Warren character, although he's not Ed Warren, but he and his wife right. are the, the paranormal investigators and they go out. So it's worth a watch. Go check it out on, uh, on the YouTubes. I will check that out. That's so funny. Yeah. yeah that, but, so I can tell you this. So, mm-hmm. um, the, the first conjuring the the house in Rhode Island, um, right. They never talked about that case ever, ever, hmm. ever, ever. Right. Like not once this one, this one they talked about, they talked about mm-hmm. it quite a bit. Even I remember hearing about it because I mean, shoot, we were ground zero. You know, I remember Ed saying right. this all started here in Newtown, you know, and, uh, and, and then it went to Brookfield and, and you know, Brook, you, you drive it is just a couple miles and you're in Brookfield. So it was, um, it really hit home to think like, wow, this, this horrible, evil thing, uh, happened in our town. And not only that, I remember, I mean, I remember hearing stories as a kid, this was the satanic panic. This was the eighties. And mm-hmm. they'd say, you know, that it, there's a, there's a pentagram and Newtown is one of the points on the pentagram, which by the way, any town on earth could be a point on a pentagram, right? It's just <laughs> wherever you start it. Right? <laughs> right. Um, but still it was one of those things that went around and you went, Whoa, look, if you line up a pentagram, you could put the top right on Newtown. And then you're like, you can, Sure. Yeah. You can. But you know, where does can. the rest of the the yeah. star go? What is it touching? Or if it's touching Amityville and and uh, Rhode Island, and it's touching all these major haunted places, then maybe you've got something. Then we're talking about a paranormal ley line situation, right? Right. So, it, but it was it was uh you know because uh, Ed would tell us there's satanic cults in town. The police call us in uh, when they find things they don't understand, and we we gather that stuff and bring it back to our museum. And and Ed's attached museum their house in monroe was at the end of a cul-de-sac i just like it was like off the main drag route 25 there was this street and then they were at the end and it was just a a simple split level ranch you know they weren't wealthy people it was a a middle class house with like this attached building that was the museum and every kind of thing in there from annabelle i remember meeting annabelle face to face when i was uh you know uh the first time i was at their museum which i was probably like 16 i guess when i was in there and, and and the real Annabelle scared me way more than anything in the movie because right. the movie one right like you bring that that the movie doll home for your your daughter your daughter would be like yeah get it away right no one's right. cuddling with that thing but the real one of course is a Raggedy Ann doll and my sister had the same one on her bed the exact same and I was just like oh right I mean that's yeah. that's scarier to me than like that horrific thing in the movie. Let me let me say this about that. Uh, many people called out the Conjuring movie and Annabelle because that's not even the real Annabelle. The real Annabelle was a Raggedy Ann, right? And there was no way that the company that owns Raggedy Ann is going to allow their beloved character to be shown as a demonic creature in a movie. So it's not Hollywood faking it. It's simply we don't have the rights, and if we get them, Licensing. we're not going to pay a yeah. million dollars for. For that, I'm, I'm I'm betting because I can't see Raggedy Ann and Andy still being big sellers. I'm I wondering if they're kicking themselves like M and M's did when Reese's Pieces got the gig with ET and their stock went through the roof, right? Should should they right, have right. done that? Would there be a renaissance in in uh, in dolls? Well, this case that we're talking about opens up 41 years ago. As a matter of fact, tomorrow the third, right, is when this thing started. July no, 3rd. today, today, July oh, 1st. Really? Today. Yeah. All right. Even better. So we're Today. right there. For those of you listening on the podcast on Friday, you're sandwiched in between the two. So you're still Sorry. right in the wheelhouse. It's a perfect time. But um, it, it starts off with this just very basic part of life, right? There's a family and and the daughter and her boyfriend are about to strike out on their own and rent a place and kind of live their own lives. And Things take a twist. They take a really bizarre turn. It's complicated, this one. So just to set it up, uh, Debbie Glatzel, she's 26 year, years old, and she has a seven-year-old son. And her boyfriend is Arnie Johnson. He's 18. 
And before you start doing the math, uh, the son was from a previous relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, they're living in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is a city. Um, and, and at that time, not the nicest city that you could be in. Debbie has a roommate who has three daughters. She's divorced. And so they're, they're all in this, this apartment. They're trying to get by. And so they figure, hey, if we pool all our money, we could move out of, uh, out of Bridgeport. And there's this house in Newtown that's perfect. And Arnie is a tree surgeon and a landscaper. And, you know, you're better off being out in the country than in the city where, you know, people mm -hmm. actually need your services. So they find this house and it's a house with like an attached apartment. And the idea is that Arnie and Debbie and Debbie's son will live in the house and the attached apartment will be perfect for uh, Debbie's roommate and her three children. And they can all live there. Need some fixing up, need some TLC, but that's okay. Arnie's young. He's ready to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's July 1st that they arrive at the house in Newtown. And immediately there are problems. Uh, for example, the furniture from the previous tenant is still there, some of it. And they're like, ah, oh, come on, you know? So that's already a problem. Problem two is that the attached apartment, there's a woman living there and it's the daughter of the landlord. This is, And she's like, I have no intention of leaving anytime soon. And so now like so, so big problems, right? Like right. just from the minute you get up there, now, uh, Debbie's family, the Glatzels, have come over from Brookfield to help move in. Again, just a couple miles up the road. Just, you know, there happens to be a town line in between. And so Debbie's three younger brothers come in and Debbie's mother walks in and she's the first one to say, this house doesn't feel right. Never mind the furniture. Never mind that the, you know, the landlord's kid's still in the attached apartment. This place just doesn't feel right and she's uncomfortable. And so already, like, imagine that. Imagine you're, you're ready to like, you've, and you've, by the way, you've pooled every penny you have to pull this off, right? You, there's no wiggle room financially. So you get there and it's just problems. But of course, it's about to get a lot worse. All right. So let's, uh, let's dig into that. And then I want to, I want to kind of do a comparison to another very famous case uh, that the Warrens also had a, a hand in, but you, you get them in there, uh, you know, David Glatzel and Alan, I believe is the other son, uh, brother, correct. They come in to help and mm -hmm. things start to occur. Uh, what exactly is that timeline? Do you know? I mean, is it that day yep. as they're moving stuff around? Yep. So it's day one and Debbie's putting her brothers to work as you would on move in day. Right. So she tells her, her youngest brother, David, who's 11 years old at the time, uh, go, you know, bring this box back to the master bedroom and, and sweep up for us. And so David goes back there and suddenly he's pushed down by an unseen force onto the bed and he's mm. freaked out. There's no one back there with him. And then he sees this old man, sort of semi-transparent. It's a ghost clearly to him. And the old man's threatening him, you know, take down your crucifixes at home, take down your, your St. Michael's prayers and your, your religious medals. And the kid, David's freaked out as anyone would be and pretty much races out of the house and goes and sits under a tree on the front lawn of the house and refuses to go back inside. He's done for the day. Like that's that. His two brothers will go back in that room to carry some boxes as well. And they claim that the door slammed on them and they couldn't get the door open and they're screaming and banging. And, and finally they get the door open and they're something's weird. Something is really weird in this house, but it's only those three brothers that notice it. And so mm -hmm. Uh, this is all day one. Everybody's uncomfortable. And of course, people are angry because wait, this is not what we agreed to, right? Uh, there should be the furniture should be gone. That apartment should be available. Um, Debbie's roommate from Bridgeport's getting ready to move up. And, and now what do we do? And so that first night, it's decided that everybody's going to sleep at the Glatzel's house because this, this house is in no state to have Debbie and uh, Arnie stay there. So they all go back to Brookfield and that's when things start to evolve quickly, all still July 1st. And the three, bo the three brothers are talking. And uh, suddenly the, the two brothers are like, something weird happened in that back bedroom. And then David says, wow, something really weird happened to me. And that's when he goes out to tell the adults. He goes into the kitchen and he says, I got to tell you something. I think there's a ghost in that house. It's haunted. And at first they're like, you're just an over imaginative kid. You're just, you know, whatever. You're tired. It's been a long day. Um, but then David says, and this, this, this part freaked me out. So David says, I can see the old man from here in Newtown, miles away, hills and trees and all kinds of things in the way, but he can see the old man and he says, he's angry and he's coming this way. He can see the spirit coming from the next town over 
toward the house in Brookfield, getting closer and closer. And pretty soon he says, he's here. And then he doesn't call him the old man anymore. He calls him the beast. And what's interesting, I thought in all of the interviews I've watched, not only in the shock doc, the devil made me do it on discovery plus, but in other, um, uh, vignettes that have been placed on the internet and, and on other shows throughout history, they all stand by the fact that David Glatzel, although a young boy with a big imagination, was not prone to telling stories or lies. This, this was outside of his normal. Right. Absolutely. And and so this kid is suddenly uh, scared um, and he's seeing something that no one else can see in the house. It's important to point out at this point that the Glatzel family are devout Roman Catholics. They go to mm -hmm. church uh, regularly. And um, so when things start to get stranger in the next couple of days where, where David is now s tormented, right? Something, something's pushing him, scratching him. Uh, they're worried about him. And, and it doesn't seem to be psychological because they know their kid. And again, like what happened? He just spent a couple hours in this house in Newtown. He didn't go away for a week and something horrible. It was just what happened. And so uh, they reach out to their clergy, which is what you would sort of expect. And right. keep in mind, this is 1980. There are no reality shows on the paranormal. There's no internet, right? You go to your church and you keep it quiet. And that's exactly what they did. And the priests come out and they, they say blessings on the house. They light candles. They, they leave religious medals and things like that. But they see that there's something really wrong with young David, that he's being attacked by something that no one else can see. And that's when the, the clergy suggests, hey, there's this couple in Monroe that sort of looks into this stuff, uh, sometimes even investigates for the church, you might want to call Ed and Lorraine Warren. And I can tell you, David, having grown up in that area, like that's just something every local would know. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't be at the grocery store being like, oh yeah, house is haunted, the kid's getting attacked. But if you so much as confided in any neighbor, like oh, something really weird is happening. If you have like five neighbors, two or three of them would know about the Warrens. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's just, that's, it's just how that's, that's how it was. And so they called Ed and Lorraine Warren and Ed and Lorraine Warren came right over. Uh, I think it was 10 o'clock at night when they, they came over for the very first time to check it out. Now, let me ask you something. We're mm -hmm. also skeptical in nature, both of us. Sure. Now people need to also be aware that the Amityville horror experience and the book and the movie have all come out about this time as well. Right. So is uh, there a couple thought? years earlier, but not too long. Right. Yeah. Right. So, Hey, what if, you know, we've got this house that sucks. It's not what we were expecting, not what we promised. Uh, what if we say it's haunted and we get out of the lease that way? Do you think there was any thought about that being a part of this process? Uh, but it, with that said, if my understanding is the woman that did live there also witnessed and saw things, is that correct? Yeah, so uh, it's July 3rd when mm -hmm. they go back to the house in Newtown. The woman that lived there before has now come to get, I think she had her waterbed there. Like she was coming to get the last of her things. And Debbie sort of confronts her and says, hey, look, you know, my, my brother seems pretty freaked out by something here and, and sort of presses her. And finally the woman says, yeah, I think I think the back bedroom's haunted. And, and like, that's about the end of it. And I'm getting out of here. Like I got my stuff, I'm gone, good luck. Uh, that's the same time Arnie Johnson goes down to the basement and um, he, in the basement, there was this weird structure that was built of like plywood, but he couldn't get in it. It was just like this locked up thing. And it, it makes you uncomfortable when you can't get into something that's mm -hmm. been placed there. Uh, and he said, as he was walking out of the basement, something tapped him on the shoulder and there was no one else down there. And that sort of freaked him out. July 3rd is, is when they start arguing with the landlord about you know, we want out of this lease. The place is haunted, number one. But to me, the bigger issue is that apartment is supposed to be empty. So we have the other person to pay the rent that we can afford. And that that's this is not the deal at all. I would get out of that lease too. I think in right. this case, I think in this case, you got to rule out. Uh, they just didn't want the place because of ghosts. Like they had a super rock solid excuse that no one would argue with. That this is not the deal we signed on for, right? We we signed on for a house and an apartment, and you're telling us it could be another month or two before that apartment's ready, and that's not going to work. 
it's it, all of this is so convoluted, right? I mean, there's just so many different twists to this that don't make sense with what's going on. Now, did this roommate, do we know anything about the, the woman that was renting the little apartment? Was she feeling or dealing with anything supernatural? Has there ever so, been any reports? Yeah, we don't know much about her. We know that she was the daughter of the landlord. So um, she sort of had a, a horse in the race to not, you know, rock the boat too much. Um, mm -hmm. Plus, like she was making problems for her mother, you know, like uh, by not mm -hmm. getting out of there. Oh, who knows what they agreed to or didn't agree to. We just know that, um, you know, when they got there, this this person was was there and this this house is no longer going to work for uh, really these what five, six people. Right. The, the right. roommate, the three daughters, Arnie, Debbie and Debbie's son. So six people into this house and apartment. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I think it's fair to rule out just got cold feet on a lease. Uh, they wanted out of Bridgeport. They wanted to live in a house and, um, and, and start their lives. I wonder if, if Ed and Lorraine ever considered that the woman who stayed behind the daughter, was she responsible for conjuring these things to get these people out of the place she did not want to leave? So what's interesting is by July 3rd, 4th, 5th in there, like just, you know, mm -hmm. five days, right? Since it started. Uh, the story is no longer anything to do with Newtown, right? Newtown is is just it's it's uh, an afterthought now because the entity has moved to Brookfield and not even really moved to Brookfield. It's attached to David. It's all about uh, David. That's that's what seems to be going on. So was the house a conduit or was the house uh, inconsequential? Really, it just was an opportunity. I, I don't know. Um, and the other thing but too, right? But like, there's being this demon this dark force that that mm -hmm. uh looks like a man during the day and a beast at night again the question remains which is one of the most terrifying elements of the story to me like you and i know a lot of times it's in inviting things in but david seemed innocent of all of this yet the force attached itself to him and now so people understand there's infestation which is what this appears to be at first. There's oppression, which is the slowly breaking the people down and it pressing and pushing, which is kind of what it was doing to date. Well, not kind of, it was definitely doing to David. The, the hopes is it's trying to break you down to the point where you give it that free reign. And it kept telling David, I want your soul, right? You belong to me. Give it well, up. I, actually, no, I, I, th I think it said, I want a soul. Uh, I think it, 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 I don't know if it was, I, I, I forgive Maybe me. Maybe it was I'm, working I'm, for David's soul. It was the seventies and early eighties. Right. Right. <laughs> but I, 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 but I think it, it was, it was there for a soul. It was there to claim a soul. The assumption was David, but later on the narrative would sort of get rewritten to like, well, why would you assume it was there for David? David was the way in for sure. And David had huge problems. However, Maybe David wasn't the target. Maybe the target, or maybe the target was anyone. It was it was taken whatever it could get. Um, so, but then you know the, the clergy gets involved, and then Ed and Lorraine get involved. And when the Warrens come over, and I think it was within days of all this beginning, right? Like uh, once mm -hmm. the priests come, and and when the Warrens come, it, it's it, it's in the evening, and they bring with them a medical doctor. And if I remember correctly, uh, I think the doctor just stumbled walking up to the front door, just like, you know, tripped over his own feet. No big deal. Um, but then they get inside and they sit down at the table and David made a comment about the doctor tripping. And that perked Ed Warren up immediately because no one saw it except the Warrens outside. It was just someone stumbling, you know. Um, so, you know, Ed suddenly like, hmm you weren't there yet you know this thing that happened and so ed started to test david and david could see things that was that were happening in the other room well not david but the entity within could convey the information sort of like seeing through walls and and now ed warren is is kind of given this thing his full attention that all right i don't think this is fake i don't think this is imagination um you know there's something really off with this kid and uh and and now they're they're involved and now ed and lorraine are are dealing with this case as a a possible possession case and how and scary it, it, how scary do you think it has to be for everybody involved that you go to the to the church which really should be the authority on this and you go for help they come and they see scratch marks and bruises and and many different things that are outside of that realm and the church says you better call ed and lorraine 
I mean, that's kind of bizarre to me, right? That the church who you think would be the ultimate help in this are like, uh-uh, go talk to the Warrens, right? And and that was Father Dennis, I think, that referred them over to Ed and Lorraine. Um, right, right. They come with so this So here's where I... Right. Now, the physician, though, I, this is the part that also confused me. They they all see the welts and bruises, and at one point he said he was being stabbed, and there was a huge mark that appeared like he had been stabbed. You know, not an incision, but a welt. How does a doctor come in and look at this and not think there's some kind of abuse taking place? Okay, this is where we have to uh, set some context for all of the Please. things you just said, mm -hmm. right? So uh, the story has been told like the book that came out, I think it was in 83, right? About mm -hmm. this case was very much told with Ed and Lorraine Warren as the hero. Mm -hmm. This movie, the conjuring three is Ed and Lorraine Warren as the hero. Um, so, uh, you know, and Ed would tell you, you know, when the church is scared, they call me. Right? right. Because that, that, and I don't think that's necessarily true. I don't think father Dennis gave up on the Glatzels, right? They were, they were still going to church regularly. I think he was checking in with them. But I think uh, he also understood uh, the more evidence that they could gather, maybe there's more that they could do for, for the Glatzel family. Because mm -hmm. in Catholicism, you don't just knock on the door and ask for an exorcism. Like they, it's, there's a whole rigmarole, you know, it's right. um, th there, there's an investigation. And so the way it works today, this, this is how it goes. Like if you believed you had a real problem, you would go to your church and you would talk to your priest. And if your priest suspected at all that you're, there might be something to this, the priest informs the diocese and the diocese has an investigator within the diocese somewhere. You don't know who it is. It's it's a sort of a secret, but that person gets activated to come investigate. There's a medical doctor, there's a um, you know, psychological evaluation. If they still think there's something going on, they go to the archdiocese and the archdiocese investigates. And then it goes to Rome. And then Rome sends an exorcist from somewhere in seclusion, somewhere on the planet. It's not like, you know, they don't even train priests in exorcism anymore. They, they, that stopped in the 70s. They, they, they haven't, you know, any modern day priest has never been trained in an exorcism. And the reason they'll tell you is because baptism is an exorcism. So that's all they know is just the rite of baptism, which includes an exorcism within it. The, anyway, oh. so, um, uh, so, so there's that part of it. The medical doctor that Ed and Lorraine Warren brought, let's be honest, he's a fan. He's a fan of the Warrens and he's a fan of the paranormal and he wants to see stuff. And so the Warrens say, oh, you're a medical doctor. We'll bring you on cases and we'll get your input. So yeah, I'm sure he, at the end of the day, that, that guy was still a medical doctor, um, but he's also working on a case with Ed and Lorraine Warren. So it's not like they hired him to come in as an independent person. He, he is a little bit partial and already believes in this stuff, right? And wants to see, see for himself. So again, just sort of setting the okay. tone a little more. Um, but you're, you're right. Like if I see a kid all beat up, my first thought is like, are you safe here? And forget demons. Like are, are there right. people doing this to you? Um, I, I agree. I my brain would go to the same place, but I think, the Warrens and this doctor had seen enough that first night to know that this 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 kid is is speaking in in strange voices. Eventually, he started using language he didn't know, uh, Latin and things like that, um, voices that that didn't seem to come from him, and was 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 you know being attacked by unseen forces. And so, at and some then, point, is this right that he actually gives the name when they ask who is this being? It states it is Satan. Yeah, sure. That's what I would say too. Right, right. <laughs> and, and the reason I mentioned that is uh, one of the biggest points for exorcisms and deliverance is to know the name of the demon. It's easier to extract them according to the legend and lore for exorcisms. So yep. for it to give its name, you go to the big name, right? You're, you're, you might be Larry, the demon cable guy, right? And But you're not going to say that. You want them to really fear who you are. And it, it, I, I say that laughingly, but we just did an article uh, of two weeks back on darkness radio where, um, where the gin are very popular and, and, you know, they believe that they are the root of most evil cases. This couple is dealing with gin, uh, a, a gin by the name of Bob, and then another one by the name of Rita. And it's kind of like, those are like the least intimidating gin names you could, as I had to laugh and sent the article to my ex-wife because her parents' name are Bob and Rita and they're right. 
you know, pastor and his wife up in uh, Minnesota and uh, Bob and Rita, the gin, it just doesn't. So obviously I'm going to, well, who are you? I'm Satan, right? You want that. There's that intimidation factor of this thing to try to mess with anybody that's coming into contact, maybe giving them a second to pause and think, I don't want to be a part of this. Well, even worse, uh, Satan or not, uh, the the entity claimed that there were dozens, numbers. They wouldn't give a name, just numbers, right? There are mm-hmm. dozens of us. Uh, um, I so, thought it was 42, I think. Is what yeah, it was, it was yeah. 40, yeah, 40 something. I, I'm not remembering the exact number, but it, yeah, it was like 40 something of us. And people, you know, the, the people, the Glatzels would see shadows and things like that. And so uh, imagine the panic. And th- I know you're a dad, I'm a dad. It, keeping your kids safe is like, that's the first job. Like that's right. it. And so if your kid is being attacked by something you can't see, Oh, I can't even imagine no. the feeling of helplessness. It's it. Well, it's terrifying. And as a parent, you're still a human, right? You're still, when, when my son comes downstairs and he's very little and he tells me there's a boy on my top bunk, dad. And I say, honey, that's your brother. And he says, no, dad, Nathan's sleeping. This boy's sitting on the upper rung, looking down at me like this. Right. And he tips his head and gives this creepy look. I grab him and I cuddle him and I said, okay, you're safe with dad. And then I'm sitting there going, I don't want to go up there and mess with this (laughs) thing. Right. But my other son is laying in bed next to this being. So it's like every, I, I, I honestly, in all honesty, for five minutes, I laid there debating what the right thing to do was (laughs) as a human. You're like, God, I don't want to see this, right? If I go up there and there's legitimately a kid sitting there staring <laughs> down, I'm done. I'm cooked. So yeah. I, my, my moment in the sun, you know, I'm in boxer shorts and a t-shirt and I'm storming up the stairs, flipping every light on the house, trying to sound as tough. Like, who are you? I'm Satan, right? I'm like, there better not be a goddamn ghost in my kid's room. I'm going <laughs> to grab it by the sheet and wring it out. Rah, rah, rah. And, I'm, and the whole time I'm like, oh, <laughs> <terrified>. <laughs> that I'm going to run into this. Let's yeah. uh, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll dive deep into this case as well. Folks, I also want to make a quick mention to you. For those of you in and around the Minnesota area, if you are around and interested, you can come see me next weekend. I'll be at the Minnesota Para Unity Convention. Uh, that is the 2021 Minnesota Para Unity Con, July 8th through the 10th at the Duluth Entertainment Convention Center in Duluth, Minnesota. MNParacon.com. That's MN paracon.com come on out and uh, see me it's gonna be a great time there are a lot of paranormal uh celebs that are going to be on hand and uh, doing talks and meet and greets and hanging out so we'd love to see you and again there'll be a link for that in today's program guide so you can find it a little bit easier we'll be back we've got more to discuss right here on darkness radio Welcome back to the program. Thank you for tuning in. This is Darkness Radio. And for all of you watching live, we're going to try to work in some of your questions. I know we get a lot of people hopping out there. We're going to try to get to some of these questions as we move through this, but I want to get through the bulk of the story. And I also have some audio to share in a few moments. So we're talking about uh, the possession of David Glatzel. Uh, we haven't even gotten to the murder case yet, so I know we need to pick this pace up. But David Glatzel, this young boy, is being tormented Um uh, He's dealing with these hor- horrific things, marks on his body. The the Warrens come in to try to help. They're they're hearing this child speak, and and you got to give it to the family. They were recording everything. They would record every time kids started acting strange. So they have all this for Ed and Lorraine to review, and while they're there and helping. Ed is giving tips and hints to the family on what to do in the event that something happens when they're not there. And I've actually got some audio from that, um, uh, hearing it. And it's very disturbing. I just, I'm going to give you a fair warning on that folks. So Jeff, I'm going to play this out real quickly. And this is actual audio from the conjuring case and the possession of David Glatzel. In the name of Jesus, Jesus repels you. Leave this child alone. It's on your forehead. Yes, younger, you are not strong. You're weak. You're, you're weak. Ryan. Jesus Ryan. loves this boy. This is a child. Wake him up. Wake him up to something. 
You won't get out of it right now, Ma. You told me, Mary, you won't do nothing now. Well, what do you think you've been doing all this time? I'm father and a son in the whole series of eight men. You got to hold the mommy told me to. Hold the mommy's mommy. Get it. Mommy's here. Mommy's here. Come on. Wake up. Come on. Get up. Come on. Let's go. Get out of my son. Get out of my son. Come on. Come on, son. Come on. Get up. Get away from my son. No. Run, your mother. David. David. Get up. 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 Get Man, that is one of the most terrifying pieces of audio. You know, you're listening to this little kid and, you know, the mom's, you're my son. Oh, let me uh, close that down. You, uh, you hear this voice from this child. It's inhuman. It's terrifying. Mother's calling out in despair. You know, this is my son. And and he calls back. If you couldn't hear it, he goes, you're a bitch. And then starts with that sinister laughing. And as Arnie's, and I thought it was impressive, right? Again, this is kind of playing into what kind of guy Arnie is. This isn't his family. He's 19 years old at the time. The family's kind of bickering in the background. Arnie's focused, man. He's like, hold him down. They said to keep him held down. And he's praying over this kid, man. He's throwing everything he can at this kid to try to release him. And this thing's just mocking. And that laugh at that <laughs> kind of laugh at the end is absolutely bone chilling, man. That is one of the most terrifying pieces of audio, period, I've ever heard. I remember hearing this as a kid. Like the Warrens would play this clip. Like this was a case they talked about and you heard it and you're like, that's in new, that's here in this, you know, Brookfield and the next town over. Yeah. And, um, and I, and I, I know it was in the documentary on, on uh, discovery plus it is bone chilling because it, it's, it's so compelling. Arnie uh, is, is, is trying to help, right? He's, mm -hmm. he's being altruistic, like you said, and that's ultimately what may have gotten him into trouble because there's a moment where Arnie is, is watching David just get literally punched and, and seemingly stabbed by some invisible force. He jumps on top of him. He, he takes the cross from around his neck, puts it on the forehead of David and says, you know, pick on someone your own size, take me instead. And Lorraine would tell you that's the moment when he invited him in. Sounds familiar, right? Oh, it sounds very familiar. It's, uh, it's terrifying. As a matter of fact, I've, <laughs> we got a scene here. I'll uh, pull up if I can and get it to the right moment, but it sounds uh, remarkably uh, like this. Take me. Come into me. God damn you. Take me. Take me. So you've got a, a page right out of the Exorcist movie, right? Yeah. And and you have to wonder, was Arnie influenced by this movie? Did he see that? Is that why he's thinking, I've got to do something to help this kid come into me? And, and uh, you know, you it's so important to mention The Exorcist. The movie came out in 1974, just six years earlier. And right. there's not too many people that did not see that movie. And if And Arnie would have been... 12, 13 at the time, like, yeah, he probably saw that movie and it probably scared the hell out of him. The Exorcist was very much on, even though it came out six years ago, it was very much on, on the mind of the popular culture. So uh, so th that was just a moment, but no one really thought much of it because nothing changed. David was still being attacked. Uh, the torment was still going on. But by September, the, uh, the Catholic Church had authorized the minor rite of exorcism, not the full-blown one. But they they did get to go to their their local Catholic church and they went through the uh, the minor rite of exorcism. It seemed to help at least for a little bit, um, but then it was back. Uh, the, the demon was back. But then on um, I forget the exact now, date. And, but... and what's really kind of creepy about this the demon coming back, right? Ed and Lorraine were not even so sure. They're like, let's wait till midnight and see right what happens. And here you've got a kid who claims to have been stabbed by this demon. 
Mm -hmm. When this thing manifests again and it starts taking over David, he grabs a knife and actually threatens his brother Alan with a knife. And I think these are important foreshadowing for how this story unfolds. But right. it's it's pretty chilling. He he snatches up this knife and he's threatening to kill his own brother. Again, completely out of context with who this child is. And just a dangerous situation. Let's face right. it, not only dangerous for David, but now maybe dangerous for other people in the house. And I think that's why the church maybe moved along uh, the exorcism. And anybody involved in exorcism will tell you they're usually not one and done, right? It's not like you get one and it's all set. It's, it, it's a process and it can take... Uh, weeks, months, even years. One other thing too that's important to note about this case, Ed Warren had said, you know, you talked about the various stages from oppression to, you know, finally full on possession. Right. Ed Warren had said he had, obsession and possession, yeah. Right. He had never seen a case progress this quickly. Like that that you know, from from, you know, invitation to oppression to possession can take months or even years. For, for lots of people. And this happened in the span of like days, a couple of weeks uh, to get all the way there. And so Ed Warren had never seen anything like it. The first uh, the first exorcism didn't seem to work, but then they're going to try one. Uh, I forget the exact day, but it was it was the, the day uh, Virgin Mary is, is celebrated in the Catholic Church. Right. That would be the day of the next exorcism. And, and Lorraine Warren especially thought this would be a, a significant day and have the best shot of success. Now, I, we, we need to mention as well, though, and I don't mean to cut you mm -hmm. off, but no, the, whole, the whole family is now becoming affected. The mom is feeling this hand grabbing onto her. Uh, she's being touched. There's this black, shadowy male figure that they're seeing. Now it's not just David. Now Arnie and the mom and the sister are having experiences. Um, and this demon starts, and, and again, you got to give it to his sister because she's taken copious notes and diaries of what's happening every day. This thing is threatening the family, threatening Ed and Lorraine that if they continue to interfere, he's going to kill them all. Um, and this is when they they go back. And now was this third attempt, was this when the levitation reportedly happened? Or was I that think on the levitation second? was I think that was the second one. I mean, so yeah, it's just escalating. Everything is just getting worse and worse. Uh, it's like nothing anybody had ever seen. And keep Levitation, in mind- Levitation, Jeff. Levit this, this kid yeah. is hovering above the bed and, and yelling out, David's not here. I have his soul. That's-, that's I, What the hell? That yeah, no, I know. I mean, I've never seen it, right? I, I've never- Right. I've heard of levitation. I've never seen it. And I struggle right. with that one, right? It, does it become mm -hmm. a fishing story where the kid's writhing around and you go, I think he levitated. Like, did he? Or, I mean, I don't know. You know, it's, it's so hard unless you actually see it. But uh, but this family, no doubt, is going through something horrible. And if when you watch the documentary, um, when you see Debbie talk about what she watched her brother go through, she cries, right? right. She, she All these years later, she's still choked up remembering what her little 11-year-old brother went through, Um which again, right now at this moment of the story is still very, very private. We're talking about a handful of people that know what's going right. on. It is not being you know, documented for anything other than the Warrens and to get the kid help. That's the only reason they're making recordings uh, because they wanna bring it to the church and say, this is why we need an exorcism, the full Catholic rite of exorcism because of this tape right here and this tape and these notes and this and this and this and this picture. That's the case they're trying to make for the church. And they're they're making obviously a pretty damn good case because they send Father, was it Father Grasso and Father Virgilac out yep. to to take care of this. So this is definitely escalated to a level they realize, you know, we can't just sit by idly waiting for psychological reports and medical exams. There's something amiss here that we need to deal with immediately. Yep. And so at that point, uh, the young David goes through the rites of exorcism. Um, and, and I know it sounds too, it, it sounds sort of anticlimactic, but after the third one, uh, mm -hmm. it's peaceful. It seems to be over. And this is September, September of 1980. And it, keep in mind, it started July 1st. So, you know, uh, just two and a half months or so, it, it seems to have reached a conclusion. And not only that, after the, everything calms down for the family, for Arnie and Debbie, uh, life seems to be getting better because now they're about to move into their own apartment in Brookfield. Debbie's a dog groomer. So there's a dog groomer that has a, a business and there's an attached a couple of apartments. 
that she can live in for free her and Arnie and, and Debbie's son. And, uh, and it seems like they're, they're getting their life going, which is great. Um, but it's not quite over yet. Um, now help me out on this because again, watching the documentary, um, it, it appears that the priests are working on David trying to help him. And because of his writhing and the pain and the screams, they stop this exorcism, which the first Lorraine, one, yeah. right. Ed and Lorraine are like, that's a really bad idea because now you got to start from square one again. Right. Uh, and this kid's already showing you everything you possibly need to see that he's in, in danger. But the family is at that point, you know, this uh, you're killing David. You've got to right. stop. And again, watching his body twist and writhe and scream as he's being hit with water, holy water and, and everything. Uh, and there is a very real, they've talked about this numerous different um, movies and documentaries. There is a very real chance that, that the afflicted could die during these rites of exorcism. And there was it, an it, entire movie that the exorcism of Emily Rose that talks about that. Yeah, it's brutal. Um, yeah, that was the first one because Lorraine had said uh, it was a mistake to stop the exorcism. Like, because like you said, you you pretty much have to start over, and that's why that first one didn't work. Is you you mm -hmm. stopped short. You didn't you know drive the demon out. Um, so yeah, so that's the um, the, the process going on. Um, now, in the second one, is that when Arnie is also involved in saying, "Take on me," you know, be a part of me, get out of this kid. I believe that happened at the house. Okay. Uh, I, that's that that was one of the one of the moments the kid was getting attacked and arnie was just trying to stand up for the poor kid you know um, right so yeah i think that 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 one occurred at the house but uh but two but the exorcisms but, were but the open that door right so this uh, this affliction is still dealing with the child they go to root this child out do this this final exorcism the kid seems relieved there's this respite mm -hmm. and then there's quite a, quite a while because that was all in July and it isn't until like yeah. September of, of what, 1980. That... No, September, September is the exorcism. Oh, that is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it started July 1st, September's the exorcisms, all three. Gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah. And so by, by mid September or so it's over, it's, hmm. it's, it's over uh, for, for David. He's, he's got peace and, and, you know, the family's on edge for days, you know, they're waiting for midnight and midnight comes and goes and he's still okay. And, another day and another day and he's still okay. And so everybody starts after, you know, a couple of weeks of peace seems to be behind them and they start to move on with their lives. Um, and, and that's when Debbie and Arnie, you know, find a new opportunity to live in, in town in Brookfield mm -hmm. and, um, and get into that apartment. And, um, and it seems like a pretty good deal. You know, Debbie's got a job as a dog groomer, her landlord and boss, um, you know, they're friendly, they're on friendly terms. They hang out together and uh, and they've got this place and and things are going OK until February of 1981. Um, and that's when the event takes place that um, kind of changes everything. Right. Uh, all right. Let's let's lead up to this. Now, what do we know about Arnie? Um, you know, I've really obviously is talking about through the documentaries. He was just a nice guy and he was he was congenial. But I thought that I've also heard that, you know, when he was known to drink, he might get a little unruly as some of us do uh you know is do you, do you know if there's any truth to that aspect of the story uh i, I guarantee you there's truth to that okay <laughs> which will become evident in a moment okay uh, um so the other person who liked to drink a lot was the landlord slash friend slash boss right uh, mm -hmm. a guy named um alan bono and uh alan bono was kind of like this worldly guy he lived in australia for a bunch of years and um, just really, you know, an interesting guy, but likes to drink. And so, um, you know, notorious for like, Hey, let's just get some drinks and just keep drinking. And, and, and they, that was not an uncommon thing for them to just kind of hang out and, and whatever. But it was February 16th, 1981 when Alan, uh, actually Arnie woke up that day sick mm -hmm. and he'd never missed a day of work and, but he didn't feel good. He didn't feel good at all. And so, uh, he actually called in sick, which was highly unusual. But after sleeping for a few hours that morning, he sort of felt better and he gets up and he goes downstairs to the dog grooming place. And Alan says, hey, let's the three of us go to lunch. Let's go out to lunch and, and get some food. And so they go and uh, they start drinking wine at lunch uh, on the 16th. And they come back and Arnie, you know, fixes the stereo and the, the dog groomer's 
place and and alan just keeps drinking throughout the afternoon mm. and by the by the late afternoon he's like hey let's not stop the party let's go up to uh your apartment and and we'll get some pizza and we'll just keep drinking and debbie knows because this has happened before she's like no 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 alan let's go to your apartment to continue the party because you know uh, right. then, then they have the ability to leave, not kick out their boss, right? Uh, her boss. So, uh, so they go up to Alan's apartment, and and the the drinking continues. They get some pizzas. Um, they're they're getting a little bit belligerent. Everybody's pretty drunk, and Debbie wants to leave. Uh, Alan's like, no, 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 stay. And I think he tries to grab her, and that's when Arnie sort of snaps a little bit and and gets no, no, we're out of here, we're leaving, and pulls Debbie out of the apartment, and they start to walk out. And Alan chases them. And then that's when Debbie says something completely changed in Arnie. Uh, his face changed, his facial expressions. He was not there. He was not himself. And she says all she recalls is the two men sort of collided like they're fighting. And the next thing she knows, Alan just slumps over onto the ground. And she sees a knife on the ground glowing. And Arnie is in a daze and just walks away. And she didn't know where the knife came from. She didn't know anything, but suddenly this guy slumped over. They, they call the ambulance, call the police. He's rushed to Danbury hospital and Arnie just wandered off into the night. Uh, a couple hours later, Alan will die from being stabbed uh, multiple times. Um, and he's gone. And, and Arnie is picked up about two hours later by the police, just wandering by the woods, by the street. And, and, and the police even said like, you know, he was just, dazed he didn't put up a fight he was confused like go with us okay sure i'll go with you if you want you know that's fine and and uh gets gets in the car and and brings it in let me tell you how small brookfield connecticut is this was the first murder in the history of the town ever the, the hundreds of years that had been there there had never been a murder to the police this looks so open and shut two guys drinking all day they fight. Maybe, you know, the landlord made a pass at the girl and people got mad. Someone had a knife, stabbed the other guy, killed him. This is it. It's over, right? That's that's an open and shut case for, for murder. And then Ed and Lorraine Warren get involved again. And that's when this, that's why we're talking about this right now. Right. If, if that was the end of the story right there, we, it'd be gone. It would be so obscure. Like we would never, ever talk about it. And you never would have heard about the exorcism. But right here, Ed and Lorraine Warren jump in and say, wait a minute. Uh, Arnie was there for all these exorcisms. He was there in the house. He's not responsible for his actions. He was possessed and therefore should not uh, be held accountable. They, they, they uh, help hire Marty Manella, a lawyer who's a, a, a devout Roman Catholic. And, uh, and, and, and they're instrumental in saying, look, we want to we wanna bring exorcists, priests, clergy, put them all on the stand and prove that uh, exorcism's real, that people can be possessed, and that ultimately Arnie Johnson should not be convicted of murder because he was not under his own power. Now, what do you think about the case that when David first had his experience, the first mm -hmm. question Arnie, and he says it in the documentary, is, hey, did you find some pills? Maybe you took a pill, or were you, you know, he's alluding to maybe there's drugs around, right? And it might have been, yeah. Could have been. Uh, Debbie sees the knife and it's glowing, right? And and he, Arnie's in this kind of weird haze. You know, is, is there any mention during any of this of drug use or, you know, uh, anything that would lead us to believe that maybe it was more natural than supernatural? I, I saw no, I mean, in the books and in the newspaper articles, I saw no mention of drugs, mm -hmm. but everyone freely admitted they drank all day, right? right? So there was absolutely alcohol. Um, so, so we know that for sure. Um, but now yeah, again, here, here's the, the headline of the day, Brookfield demons murder trial to open with devil for a defense. So this is, this is record breaking, right? I mean, the fact yeah. that we're going to we're really what they're going to do is put the devil on trial in this case, because they want to prove that this is real. And I've got to guess, this is a, a, obviously it's getting a lot of attention. The, the attorney's kind of like, yeah, let me see what you have to say before I agree to this. They show the outline of everything that's gone on. Right. And again, and play the tape. The tape is the thing Manelli says convinced him hearing that audio. Right. 
Now, you've also got a kid who claims to have been stabbed by this demon, pulls a knife on his own brother at one point, and then how does Arnie kill Mr. Bono? With a knife. With a knife. Yep. It's pretty pretty interesting and compelling to follow that thread through this as well. But they're, they're really trying to build this case up. And I, I wonder, you know, I mean, you, you talk about this before it even goes to trial. How is that impacting and affecting the people of the community at the time? So it, it the Warrens turned it into an international media circus. There's no mm -hmm. question because they started saying like, you know, hey, you put your hand on the Bible and you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, so help you God. The court believes in God. Don't they have to believe in the devil? And I love, you know, and you can see this in the documentary, some of the man on the street interviews from, from 1981, you know, the old, you know, well, what do you think? Like, oh, I think it's ludicrous. Do you believe in God? Well, sure I do. I go to church. Well, don't you believe in the devil? Yeah. And you can see the sort of discomfort start to come right. over their face where they're like, yeah, maybe I'm not so sure, you know? And, um, and, and so for some people it was like, yes, this, this not only validates, uh, you know, what may have happened, but it validates my belief system, my Roman Catholicism. It validates, you know, that there are angels and demons and God and devil and so on. I, I what no one talks about in this is how incredibly from a potentially selfish place, Ed and Lorraine Warren were coming. I don't think it was so much about getting Arnie off for murder. I think it was about validating their work and them, mm -hmm. you know, in the court of law. Ed Warren was hung up on that. He talked about this case over and over. Um, and, and, the th and, and a quick other case he worked on that he bragged about every chance he'd give him is I proved in a court of law that ghosts are real. And this was in a completely separate case in Connecticut. A woman moved into a haunted apartment and uh, he went and, and presented all this evidence and said, this place has a stigma. It was haunted. The landlord knew it. And my, you know, this, this person shouldn't be held liable to the lease. And ultimately uh, the judge allowed them to break the lease. Maybe not believing in ghosts per se, but at least saying, well, the place had a stigma and you didn't disclose it. Um, and, but Ed took that as validation for his life's work and he got to prove ghosts are real in a court of law. That's how mm -hmm. Ed would tell the story. And this was him trying to do that on a huge scale, right? There's a murder involved. And so I don't even, I don't know how much he cared about Arnie Johnson or not. Um, but I think for him, it was more of an opportunity to grab the spotlight, to be in the spotlight, to be in the media and validate everything and, and, and just put it all there in front of the judge, not just the, the court of, of uh, the legal system, but the court of public opinion. Now, I know a lot of people had asked me prior to this, um, program tonight did did ed truly suffer a heart attack as portrayed in the movie the conjuring during this case was there any any kind of medical condition he dealt with i thought that was years and years later i, I that's what i thought as well but they in, like in the movie no i don't think so yeah he suffered a stroke and i think in 2005 2000 yeah. early part of 2006 um so yeah they they show that in this movie as though the the demon is trying to stop ed warren at any cost so he suffers a heart attack and he's kind of throughout the movie dealing with the repercussions of that but i didn't know if he ever talked openly about yeah. being af affected or afflicted from dealing with the demon in that case he talked about being affected and afflicted all the time he's he, mm -hmm. you know he would say stuff follows me home like that the, they have my number uh he talked about being on uh i think it was like interstate 84 or something in pennsylvania and, uh, and, and he said, you know, a demon attacked his car and they, they drove off the road. Like he blamed it on a demon, like all the time, not for this case in particular, but just in general, uh, he was quick to say that, that they had his number and he had theirs. Uh, Ed believed he was a, a warrior, right? He was not just a, a ghost investigator trying to capture a ghost on film. He was a religious warrior who, who came from a very Roman Catholic background, had his weapons, which would be holy water and crucifixes and religious medals and prayers, uh, and, and, and believed in evil and believed in fighting evil. That was his, his line over and over again. And this case for him brought it all together. However, uh, it, the demon didn't have to stop Ed Warren. The demon had to stop the judge because <laughs> that's right. who's ultimately going to make a lot of decisions here. And that's, uh, that's when things changed on the case is when, uh, when the judge sort of opened up the proceedings. Right now, this is and this is pretty um, pretty bizarre, right? I mean, they're going to go to court. They've already talked about the, the fact that they're going to really put the devil on trial. Mm -hmm. yep. You get your attorney in there; they do their opening deal. He stands up to make his opening arguments, 
And the judge, the judge steps up and he goes, Hey, let's yeah. just get this straight. Yeah. This demon defense shit, it is, it's not going to cut it in a court of law. Yeah. Uh, not I'm not all. saying the devil doesn't exist, but it, it can't in this story. We need to just focus on this, which means that then Marty Manila has to flip quickly mm -hmm. and figure out a new tact with no, really no time on how do you deal with this? This was your, your battering ram to shatter, you know, the glass ceiling and put this on trial. Do you, I, I obviously Ed and Lorraine believed Arnie was possessed. Hey, I'm um, real quick. Did you see the date on that article you just put up? Let me pull it up here. October 29th, 1981. Two days before Halloween. I don't know. Whatever. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, no. That's, yeah. A judge Wednesday threw out the demon defense of a murder defendant who claimed he was possessed by the devil when he stabbed a friend to death. I'm not going to allow the defense of demonic possession, Superior Court Judge Robert J. Callahan told lawyers for Arnie Carlson. Uh, or I'm sorry, Arnie Cheyenne Johnson on the opening day of Johnson's trial. Evidence of demonic possession is simply not relevant. Now, that's an interesting comment to me. That's not, he's not throwing it out, but he's saying it's not relevant, but yep. it, it it should be relevant, right? It, again, no. all of the laws that we have are predicated on the Bible and God and thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not do this. But then the concept that the devil doesn't exist or that he has no power or authority over us is kind of an interesting this, this to me, this is what, this is the best part of this discussion of this whole case, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Let's say the devil possessed him mm -hmm. and, and made him kill Alan Bono right there. So if you believe in basically any of the major world religions, we have free will. Mm -hmm. We have free will to choose to do good or choose to do bad. If a demon can completely overtake our body uh, and then we lack free will. And so, come on, right? That's not that's not how it works. We have to be able to overcome those urges. We have all been in rush hour traffic, all of us, at some point, right? <laughs> right. And Let's someone cuts you goes. off, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like riding down the breakdown lane and cuts into traffic and you're like, I want to kill you, but we don't, right? I'm angry. I'm gripping the wheel. I'm right. super mad. But, but the I free will it. aspect, the free will aspect is that David would not yield. He said, I'm not, you know, no, you can't have my soul. I'm not giving up my soul. He fought it, but this thing kept breaking him down. It kept with the oppression and infestation to the point that as a child, do you at some point say to end it? Stop. Yes. That's how torture works, right? That's right. waterboarding and torture is you, you eventually get the person to a point where free will is gone. I fine, fine. If it stops my pain, take it away. So to say, you know, that, that, we, you know, it affects free will. Well, it does. That's the whole concept is we have to freely give of ourselves, whether it's in a moment of desperation or not. It's that moment of just fine, take me. And Arnie said, take me, get out of the boy, take me opening that door. So I understand your point on this, but I'm just saying as the supernatural aspect of it, it it's compelling to me that you'd love to see this play out in the court of law, not for um, entertainment focus, but to see what their concepts of this would be. And isn't it interesting, just as an aside, that on the first day of court, while they're getting ready, lights are flickering, strange yeah. things are happening in the court, and uh, they're, they're sending um, maintenance to go, and maintenance cannot figure out why these things are happening. Right, right. And then the, the judge is like, mm, let's just stop this BS right now. There is no demons, there's yeah. no devil, there's no possession. So here's the other thing. Had the judge allowed this right. for some crazy reason, uh, after he's disbarred, by the way, um, right. <laughs> you know, 10 minutes later, um, uh, anybody uh, who's accused of murder in the United States would forever use this defense. All right. of them, 100%, no question. Atheists, religious people, non-religious people to be like, oh yeah, Arnie Johnson, yeah, devil made me do it. Of, maybe the devil did, but like, how come I can resist in rush hour traffic to not kill a person, but you couldn't stop it? Like, well, if, if in, you lack in Arnie's strength, case, in Arnie's case, he was schwilling. I don't, you know, this when we go out, I don't drink that often when we do live events no. because there's two Daves there's cuddly, affectionate Dave, and then there's I'm going to kill somebody, Dave. And I've learned that line. So I'm very cautious. Like, when I go to events and my wife is there, 
I don't drink. I let her drink and have fun because she's attractive. I don't mind men looking at her because why not? She's attractive, right? And and I'm and cool that with that. Uh, but when I'm drink. when I'm drinking, all of a sudden Jeff looking at my wife, bad thoughts start coming into my head, right? Yeah, but you and, know I'm uh, not looking at her. I'm looking at you. I know, but uh, but I'm just saying. I, so in those instances there's a weakness if this devil has now got this weakness on arnie and he sees this guy's drunk this is my chance yeah he's already invited me in and right now his resistance is nothing i can control this that but, that's an interesting aspect but, to the supernatural side so hold on i want to talk to drunk dave for a second okay. which one do you want affectionate drunk no, dave no. or i'm gonna kill somebody drunk i'm gonna dave. kill someone okay ready mm -hmm. uh angry violent drunk dave mm -hmm. are you there Oh, I'm here. What do you what do you want? Have you ever killed anyone? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think my lawyers would tell me just not to speak right now. Jeff. Right. right. Yeah. So you haven't. You have right. not. So no, no matter how I much could, you wanted to, you didn't. But I could see in those instances, right? Uh, I, I'm not making excuses, but you could see in those instances. I guess I am making excuses. You're that, making excuses. That's when your tolerance is lowered. Listen, we're all one bad day off from being a killer. We're but, one. You you walk absolutely. in on somebody on top of your wife or daughter yeah. violating. There's no doubt you've just become a murderer, right? Yep. No question. Yeah. I mean, no. theoretically, you'd call me and a tarp and a, a shovel would appear. Right. And I'm going to need some bleach and a shovel, Dave, and some help. <laughs> Uncle Dave would help make these yeah. things disappear. Don't right? ask anything. <laughs> just no. Just start digging. Uh, no, I, I get that. I get that. Uh, I remember, if shoot, for Ghost Adventures, I was interviewing a, uh, a corrections officer at one of the many haunted prisons we filmed at. And, and he said, sometimes you realize the difference between you, a corrections officer, and the inmate is like literally a, a 15, 20 second period of time where someone made a horrible choice. And now they're in here. And, and in other circumstances, like you guys would be fishing buddies. You know what I mean? Um, right. That's some people. He's like, some people I think were just born evil and they, they're going to do evil. And the best we can do is just lock them up and keep them away from people to keep everybody safe. But a lot of people just made a horrible choice. Maybe that One choice was to, was to drink that much and and get yourself into a place where murder was an option. Um, but whatever you're, you're responsible for that, right? You are, and, and so you mentioned before how, how David tried to get worn down, worn down, worn down, but ultimately did not, you know, survived it, went through the exorcisms. Arnie had a but, moment, but right? we don't know that we don't know if David didn't because they just found David collapsed and then things went horribly wrong. Did he finally say in a moment of desperation to stop the pain and the abuse? Fine. You can come in. And is that what then led to possession? Because levitation, eyes changing, vo yeah. vocal intonations is no longer oppression. It's no longer infestation. This is in him. So he may have broken at some point. But again, does the devil realize there's only so much I can do with an 11-year-old? But Arnie, Arnie's strong. He's young. He's, yeah. I, I can do much more damage with this guy. It's this whole case started this huge debate, a huge national, international discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. But also too, you know, I mean, you got to remember uh, this this sort of line of defense and and even uh, uh, prosecution has happened before, right? Salem, Massachusetts, sixteen ninety two, spectral evidence that the Salem in sixteen ninety two changed the world because spectral evidence was no longer allowed in the courts. And keep in mind, we were England, so that was that was on both sides of the ocean. Like no more mm -hmm. spectral evidence. It's got to be. Hard facts, not someone saying, I see a shadowy figure whispering in, in her ear or whatever. Um, and so I think I think the judge made the right call on this. I really do. Um, oh, right. No doubt. Yeah. It, like I said, just the, the researcher and investigator in me would love to have seen it play out to see, you know, them dismantle that that idea and concept. But then you hear, man, I've doing True Crime Tuesday for years. I've talked to prosecutors. I've talked to victims. I've talked to everything in between uh and journalists at the beginning of the bundy tapes on netflix in the opening intro they talk about and then his eyes went black and we actually have audio um from one of the uh the authors who did a book about him um talking about the fact that at one point when they uncovered the little girl's body and they bring it up in court they said everybody could physically see bundy's face 
contort and change and this inhuman scent of sulfur mm-hmm. emitted from him. So, you know, it's really easy to say, oh, this isn't possible. And we all want that to be the case because we don't want to believe anybody as awful as Ted Bundy could exist. But there are multiple cases where behind the scenes, the attorneys will talk and, and they're in books. And sometimes it's just one sentence in the book that talks about the fact that there was something more at play in this human than just being a bad guy. I believe there was something inherently evil and, or I right. saw this or I saw that, which leads you to believe there's something much darker about that person than just you and I getting drunk and being pissed off. Right. Bitch slapping each other in a parking lot. <laughs> Stop. No, <laughs> I get it. I get it. But, and you know what? So uh, maybe by the way, maybe this movie and this documentary and that cat are forcing <laughs> that the discussion that you want, right. That, that, that you're asking about, right. So maybe we're having it right now and getting people think, and that's why I, I love this case, right? So it, you have to ask questions about free will. And I know we've talked to you and I have friends who are demonologists or, or work in this who will say, well, when you relinquish your free will, like when you invite the demon in, you have given up your free will and thus, but I'm like, you know, but it's still, I, okay. Free will or not. Someone murders someone that I love, uh, devil made you do it. I don't care who made you do it. You're, I want you punished right. to the fullest extent of the law. No, I agree. I, I concur a hundred percent with you on, on that, but you, you see these things and you, you know, it, it makes you wonder what really is going on out there. The, the evil in, in people, you know, and the, what took place with my friend being murdered and her, two of her children slaughtered. It's hard to believe that that's just humans, that humans are that inherently evil that there's they're, not they're, they're something not. else i don't think we are inherently evil but i do think evil's in the world and i think right. we all have a duty to not just ourselves but to our friends our family our neighbors strangers across town i think we have a duty to work at it and keep it away if i i mean i can't keep it away from other people i can keep it away from me you know right. what i mean and like i can do my part to try to like spread kindness and 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 love and good vibes and stuff like that and keep the bad stuff out uh, if we all do it, if we all do our one little part, you know, um, then then things get better. You know, I mean, that kind of evil happens when when people are in bad, desperate places. So how do we how do we stop that? How do we lift people up? And and I, I think that's um, it, it, there's, there's really there's one question asked in the Bible, right? Uh, am I my brother's keeper? Right? Uh, Cain killed Abel. God said, "Where's your brother?" And Cain says, "Am I my brother's keeper?" Arguably, the whole rest of the Bible, the whole rest of the book is trying to answer that question. You know, am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for others around me? And ultimately, the answer is, is pretty much like, well, yeah, if you can help, you help. You know, if you can, mm-hmm. yes, please help your brother and everybody around you. Uh, and so I, I think that's that's our responsibility. And we, we owe it to our kids to teach them that. We owe it to lead by example and do our best to, to make it better. Now it, it has to show an openness and willingness to accept this, even though you're in this court case, you know, that they've been leading up to the devil is, you know, in in charge here, the devil made me do it defense. And then it gets thrown out quickly, but obviously it's still in the minds of jurors Mm -hmm. and of everybody because of the way this, this case unfolds, right? Because, you know, he, he is found not guilty of murder. Correct. And I think uh, November 24th, 1981, not guilty of murder, but he is convicted of manslaughter in the first degree. Right. So you've got this case that, that then tells a different story. And then he is uh, sentenced to 10 to 20 years um, in prison for this for this crime. So it has to be playing. And even in the judge's mind, in, in the back of his mind, he's got to be in a, in a place where he could have really thrown the book and gone for the full letter of the law. But even the judge seems not that he's willing to admit that there's a devil at play here, but it seems like he, he was willing to bargain. That's one way to look at it, but also two guys drinking all day, getting into a drunken brawl. Like there is a, a, there's gotta be some sort of self-defense there, right? You're fighting. So, uh, but yet someone pulled a knife and killed somebody. Mansell, I mean, if no one ever claimed the devil was involved, would he have gotten the same conviction is my question, right? right? 
uh, and if you looked at other comparable cases where, where no one claims they were possessed by the devil, just my gosh, we were drinking since noon. We got in this fight. I had my knife on me. I wasn't even thinking and I just pushed it into him. And is that, but you know, he punched me, I punched back and then I stabbed him. Right. Like it's not, it's not murder, but it's not quite self-defense either. So uh, ultimately he only served five years in jail and, and was out. And because so, of good uh, behavior, which also tells right. you something about who this yeah. guy is. Was it that one moment where we can all go good or bad? That one moment in that line and he cut and, and that was it. And that his true nature was to be this good guy. He's out in five years. And so who's, whose soul did the devil get? Bono's? Why Bono's? Like he was a murder victim, right? So, uh, and Arnie, we don't know of any exorcisms that Arnie went through. So it's just over. The devil got what he wanted. The devil didn't get a soul. I mean, Bono might have been a great guy and gone to heaven. He was murdered. He's a victim. That's that doesn't the devil doesn't get that one, right? So what do you think then? Looking at the complete way this rolls out, knowing that there was a possession and an exorcism reported, and this kid mm -hmm. is now. I, I also want to on the skeptical side as a kid, I used to be able to do weird voices and rah, rah, rah. and after watching The Exorcist, who didn't, you know. Yeah. It's a lovely day for an exorcism, right? You just create all these voices. So to to say, you know, oh, well, this kid sounds guttural and, and creepy, although he's out acting out of character, he's acting strange, uh, he's doing and in, in seeing things, and there are eyewitnesses that he's levitating, that there are other people are seeing things. This all leads eventually down the road to Arnie possibly being possessed to to create this murder what do you believe do you believe that a possession ever took place in this case yes i do i actually i believe oh, david uh, david i believe david was possessed uh because the church got involved and the church does not just give out an exorcism ever right. uh, i was raised catholic they would not just give it away like you they would have investigated and deemed it worthy enough uh to do that so i believe that there was something going on and i believe it mostly because of uh, watching Debbie describe what happened to her brother all these years later. That was this past year she described yeah. it, right? Uh, um, you know, sad, not... sadly, Debbie Glatzel did pass away in April of recently. This, of yeah. This year. Yeah. Yeah. April so of 2021. Just, just passed away. And so um, when you see her emotion when describing the torment her brother went through, that family went through something. I have no question. Whether it passed to Arnie in that one moment, that one I struggle with, but I, I do believe the, the Glatzels went through something big. I sure do. Right. Uh, now, you know, Jeff, we've always been very open on the show to give both sides mm -hmm. a chance to, to discuss this. And obviously we played out. I, I feel in your way that David Glatzel was definitely possessed. I feel that there's, there's the possibility that Arnie was possessed and maybe in that five years in prison, Religion is a very big part of, of many convicts. Maybe he was able to beat back that devil. They just don't talk about it. But I, I did place a call, and I wanted to give the devil his due. And uh, I asked, uh, hey, devil, did you do it? And he says, uh, no, it wasn't me. It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't the devil. So I don't know. You know, you can't trust the devil in these situations either. Uh, but what what a chilling creepy case would you say this this is truly one of the defining cases for ed and lorraine warren or is no it just question. one of many it's one of a few uh defining cases and you had mentioned earlier that this might be the last conjuring movie uh if i were a betting man and i have no inside information truly i'm mm -hmm. just uh the, the the case of frenchy in warren massachusetts right. satan's harvest is the name of that satan's book. harvest uh, yeah. In fact, if you see the movie The Nun, uh, which was one of the right at, spin -off. The, at the very end, the guy they're like, "Hey, what's your name?" Well, they call me Frenchy, and I was like, oh, right. foreshadowing, like that's that's going to be the guy. And that's, I mean, I've been to Warren Mass multiple times, and I know people that knew Frenchy, and like, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a that's a case the Warrens talked about a lot as well. I can't imagine them not uh, turning that one into a movie. I I thought for sure we would have seen it by now. My main thought that this may be the last one is simply because um, Ed is portrayed older in this and fragile and has this heart attack and is, you know, it just seems like a very, uh, I don't know. To me, it, it felt like this was obviously their story continued for many years you sure. know, up until the 2000s uh, before Ed's stroke and, and eventual passing. Um, 
but it is, it's chilling to think that, uh, you know, that there are so many other cases that they were involved in, but yeah, the, the mm -hmm. Satan's harvest case, I would love for them to examine that in the werewolf case. Those to me seem like the two that are served up and should be, yeah. should be shown. You Those know, they the allude to it. Yeah. yeah. They, they allude to the werewolf case in Annabelle comes home, but we have no backstory to it. So I'd, I'd love right. for people to get that. But yeah, uh, if you haven't read Satan's harvest folks, that's there's three books in my life that scared the living shit out of me. Pet Cemetery was one of them. Satan's Harvest was definitely the other one. Um, and uh, Jeff's book on Kilimanjaro. Uh, no. <laughs> it scares the hell out of me because there's no way you're going to catch me on the top of any mountain peak unless they put McDonald's 24-7 McRibs up on the top. I might yeah. join you up there for oh, that. Oh, there were. There were a ton up there. Just son of a McRibs what? everywhere. Let's go. They, I'm going to make you look like a fool. I, you, it took you like three days. I'll be up there in an hour and a half. It's McRibs. I'll be there. <laughs> uh, amazing case. I know we're going a little long here. I, is there any questions from the audience that have hung in with us? Um, I've I've missed quite a bit because we've been talking for quite a while here. If there are any questions, I'll try to address them. Um, Cindy Brown weighs in. She always has some great insight. Kids are more open to spiritual energies, and so they're easier affected by something so powerful and evil. I would think that they would also be easier to break because their fear and because they don't want to be hurt or frightened anymore, that that could be part of it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like this. I just saw the nun and now I'm scared of nuns. No joke. I told a nun to be gone. Satan. <laughs> I like uh, that. As, uh, as a kid Satan. that went to uh, CCD, which is not Catholic school, but it's like, you know, Catholic Christian doctrine and it was taught by some nuns. They're frightening. No question. They all are. Well, yeah, but what what position you know? Except the a, flying nun. The flying no, nun wasn't scary. The rest Sally of them is adorable. Yeah. Uh, or, but what what person in in uh, in a power position as a child isn't a little terrifying to you? Uh, oh. Aaron Higgins says she has a question. We'll get to it, Aaron. Let's see that yeah, question. Time to type. Um, we've got a question here from Heidi Lynn Schiffler Severson. Whew, I think that already takes place for your question. Your name's just too damn long. Do we yeah. know anything about Arnie's upbringing? So, uh, Connecticut guy, you know, the, the, we sort of jump into the story when he's 18 years old. Uh, so, um, yeah, we don't know a lot about him, just that he's a, you know, a local guy and, and, um, oh, uh, he grew up with Debbie, so they knew each other from childhood. Um, but then, yeah, that's about it. I, I'm going to bring this one up just because it irritates me and Kristen, I'm calling you out for it. Why didn't Jeff clue the Holzer files team in about most of the ocean born Mary story before they bothered to go to Henniker? because then the show wouldn't have happened. Uh, Jeff and I are best buddies. We talk all the time. And he told me when I said, we're going to investigate the ocean born Mary house. He said, well, good luck with that. If you need me, I'm here. We legitimately didn't want to, we wanted to unfold and yes, he's done episodes and he's talked about it, but we wanted to look beyond what was already said. And that's what goes on. So Kirsten, that's why it's not because we were keeping Jeff out of the loop. It's not because I don't trust Jeff. I don't trust Jeff. It was just simply that we have a story to tell. And it was one of Hans Holzer's most famous stories. So if it was called the Jeff Belanger files, we would have gone to Jeff, but we weren't, we went to uh, Hans Holzer. So I, I would watch the Jeff question. Belanger files. You do every day. I watch them sure. as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, I don't see the question from the gal who said she had a question. She never wrote one. Uh, I thought Lorraine Warren said that Amityville case is what eventually was responsible for killing Ed. And that came from Richard Jennings. I, you know, on that one, I think uh, because Amityville was so famous, they were very happy to attach their name to it at any chance they had. Mm -hmm. um, this is where like, you know, and again, I'm not trying to knock them down at all, but like they, they made a living at this mm -hmm. and, and were part, it was part show. Right. And so um, Amityville got everyone's attention all the time. So um, in fact, when they drove off the road, I mentioned earlier about on interstate 84, uh, I th they, you know, Ed had said like, oh, we passed this town and it's so beautiful out here. And we said, you know, I think not even Amityville can get to us out here. And that's when the car went off the road. Um, mm -hmm. so anyway, um, Aaron Higgins says, I was curious if the stuff's the movie, I don't understand the question. I was curious I mean, if the movie while he's in jail really happened with Ed and Lorraine, do you know, did they visit with, the, with him in jail and deal with things there as well? I don't know. I don't know of any any jail visitations. My guess is they probably moved on once he went to jail. Uh, moved on to the next case. 
I think this is the uh, cleaned oh, up right. version. Right. I'm I'm curious if the devil came into the jail and did they have the retired priest? Yeah, I don't know anything about once he goes to jail, like the story kind of ends. Like we don't yeah. we don't hear about it. And now and so Arnie Johnson's in the documentary, right? And right. we we get to hear from him. I have so many questions. I boy, if we could track him down. I don't know if he's going to still talk or maybe he's the, the door's open now. I don't know. We'll see. Well, I've got him in my trunk and as soon as he's willing to, I told yeah. him I'd let him out. So right. <laughs> Libby says, any information on where this demon went or where it came from? Did they ever do any kind of research, do you know, on the house, uh, you know, diedinhouse.com? Are there any deaths associated with it that we know about? So, yeah, no. I, well, they, they, so again, the house in Newtown, even if you read the book, right, the, the original book about it, the house in Newtown is just, it's just a place, right? It's not, uh, there's no significance they attach to it other than it, this thing was sort of lingering around looking for an opportunity. And once, you know, David came by, that was the opportunity. And then they don't talk about it again. Most of the action happens at the Glatzel house in Brookfield. Um, but they don't, but it's, again, it doesn't seem to be the house. It seems to be David. Uh, Jeremy says, I'm glad that Jeff is being real about the Warrens. I've always found them to be carnies. A lot of people kind of get that sense. You've known them and been friends with them. I don't yeah. feel that way. Uh, I, I feel that, you know, obviously in the retelling of stories, layers get added or mm -hmm. things get a little bit more exciting, but I don't, I don't believe that they were just carnies. I, I believe that they believed in what they did a hundred, hundred fifty percent. They did. There's no question they believed in it, but at the same time, they also paid, fed their selves with it. You know what I mean? They also paid their mortgage with it. Uh, and so, um, I, I mean, I've watched them sort of like straddle that line, like, you know, Hey, we've, we we want to share this and we're spiritual warriors and it's 10 bucks a seat to get in. Mm -hmm. And, and Hey, I mean, I've done it. You've done it right. Like we, we charge for our books. We charge to give lectures and programs at events and, and all that other stuff. Like we just do. And, and if people don't want to pay it, they don't have to, and they don't have to go. Right. Exactly. So there's plenty of stuff that we put out there for free for public consumption. So I get it. I get that. Um, you, you know, like you, you're, you're trying to be marketable, but at the same time be authentic. And that's a, that's the challenge. Are you a little worried that now at these events, people are going to try to feed me liquor and get me mad to see if you and I square off at some point? Uh, no, Dave, it's not that hard to feed you liquor. Like I've seen it. <laughs> Jeff, just so you guys know, Jeff's got a fanny pack that he keeps a donut in at all times. So if I start getting unruly, he just shakes it and throws it. I run like a puppy after a stick and he's out of there. There's no problem. No, I and we were at an event recently. I saw drunk Dave and, uh, and a fight broke out it, and it was you and I, I took one half of that fight. You took the other half and we totally diffused it and we right. were both we, drinking all night. Yeah. We went from sloshy, slippery Dave and Jeff to, Hey, come on guys, let's break this shit. Yeah. Let's, let's not do this here. Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We we're good. That. Uh, Jeff, you can follow Jeff and what he does and the things he's working on by visiting jeffbelanger.com. You can also check out one of the best resources on the web, ghostvillage.com. That's a, that takes me back. Yeah. That's uh, you were one of the very first paranormal sites I ever came upon back in the day. I think you built it. Was it 1887? Yes. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but you're also the host of the very popular, our new England legends. Tell us a little bit about that and how people can find you and where they can listen to you. Yeah. So the podcast is called New England Legends. Uh, we do it every week for the last 202 weeks in a row without missing one. And it's uh, they're fun. They're short, like 10, 12 minutes long, uh, scripted stories about weirdness in New England. Lots of ghosts, weird history, aliens, lake monsters, cryptids, things like that. Um, and it's just uh, sort of like, how, how did this legend get to right now is, is what we explore. And it's been super fun. And uh, in fact, next week, we're doing this case, The Devil Made Me Do It case. That'll be next Thursday. Well, it's nice with with these. They're very compact. They're easy to listen to. They're what What is the average time? Like anywhere between 10 minutes to 20 minutes long? 10 to 15, really. Um, right. Yeah, they're concise. We we use voice actors. So when we get old newspaper articles with quotes, we have voice actors. Dave's Dave's been the voice of God more than once when we have a biblical quote. Uh, so um, yeah. Anyway, it's it's been it's been so so much fun to sort of like uh, celebrate these stories and kind of build a community around it. Very cool. You can also check out, he's got a great audio book out there, um, Who Haunts the White House? And uh, you'll hear a bunch of us doing voices of former That's presidents right. and and uh, and dignitaries in that book. Um, Do you remember you which one that? you did? I don't offhand. I don't. I, and I, so 
it, it's funny. Like, I mean, I've been doing paranormal for so long and I've got friends with great voices, you know, like Dave and, and, you know, our buddy Tim Ellis and stuff. And so it, it's kind of neat when you have like these voice projects and I'll like text Dave, I'll be like, dude, can you do a voice, a line from the Bible voice of God, but I need it by like tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, all right, I'm recording at three. I'll do it then. Thanks, man. Right. You know, I, th I think I think I counted. I think I've been God three to four times on your podcast. So I'm very yeah. pleased well, well, with that. And I'm jealous if anybody else gets that role. I better be the only God you call upon. Well, I think at this point, like to be consistent, I need it to be you. Right. right. If you're like, I'm not around this week, I'll be like, oh, no, I better save the story for another uh, week. I'm like your George Burns. <laughs> <laughs> I will forever be your version of God. Hey, folks, join me at the Para Unity Con in Minnesota, July 8th through the 10th. I think it is. I've got it July 9th through the 11th, but whatever. You'll find all the info at mnparacon.com. And uh, there's a whole slate of great speakers. I think Dustin Perry, our buddy, is going to be there. Chris Fleming's going to be there. Members from Ghost Hunters, Ghost Nation. Uh, Steve Gonzalez is going to be on hand. Um, I think, uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember. There's so many. Chad Lundberg. There's so many different people that are going to be there. We'll be doing talks and, and conversations all weekend. And that's coming up next week. Uh, so make sure if you're in the Minnesota area, come on out, spend a little time. Jeff, it's always a pleasure catching up with you, man. Thank you for coming on and doing this. And uh, it's, it's a great time to have uh, pulled together on this, especially on the 41st anniversary of the beginning of this case. There's only one guy I would count on for this story, and it's you. So thank you for doing this. Thank you, Dave. Good to see you again. All right, everybody, stay safe. Be cool. We'll be back again next week with more episodes of the Best in Paranormal Talk Radio. Make sure you check out our NewEnglandLegends.com for updates on Jeff. And uh, I believe if you have the Darkness Radio phone app, uh, if you open up the Darkness Radio phone app, you can actually find the uh, the New England Legends podcast in there. We've got it as part of our cluster so that you, we make it even easier for you to find. So check that out and go check out jeffbelanger.com. Jeff, one more time, tell them about your book, Kilimanjaro. This is one of the best books, folks. You're going to love this in so many different ways. Uh, please tell them about it. And if you've got a copy, hold it up so they can see it and know what to look for. It's not nearby, but uh, I just had a book come out a couple months ago called uh, The Call of Kilimanjaro, Finding Hope Above the Clouds. It's about my 2017 climb to the top of Africa um, in memory of my brother-in-law who had passed away from cancer. And it was um, really the most profound personal experience I've ever gone through, deeply spiritual, physical, and emotional, and um, just kind of soul-bearing. So um, appreciate uh, There's been a lot of great feedback so far. You can see the reviews on Amazon, but uh, wherever books are sold, The Call of Kilimanjaro. Get it, read it, you'll love it. It does have a great spirituality and, and paranormal angle to it and just a, a great endurance book. It's it's so well written. Everybody that I've talked to that's read it loves it. My daughter borrowed it because she wanted to read Jeff's book and loves it. So check it out for yourself. Thank you all. And, uh, you know, the devil made me do it isn't going to float in court. So just knock that shit off and just be good people. That's all we're going to ask from you. And if you see Jeff and I at a location like Michigan Paracon, feel free to feed us all the liquor you possibly can and see if you can stir up some interaction between the two of us. All right, everybody, take care. We'll see you again next week right here on the best in paranormal talk radio. I'm Dave. That's Jeff. Tim, back at home. You've been listening to Darkness Radio.